Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So it's Prime Day. That's right, Amazon Prime Day. It's where we go. We buy all our garbage on, online. Uh, it's the day we uh, make sure that we get all of our cheap plastic crap from China. Uh, magically appearing on our doorstep. Uh, personally, this is the day for me where we talk about the horrible working conditions that workers toil under, uh, what they're forced to endure while we're importing that cheap plastic crap into the U.S. Uh, from sweatshops, you know, because hey, we got to get our sweatshop uh, goods. And then you know, just like magic. You know, if you remember Mitt Romney back in 2012, the sandwich just appears at sheets like magic. You push the little button and poof, there it is. Um, never mind those people behind the, the screen who are, are doing all the work. It's just magic. I'm here to share some thoughts on the magic. I've asked Jordan uh, Zakarin to come talk with us. Jordan is the media producer over at More Perfect Union, their website, perfectunion.us. Jordan, thanks for taking time for us. Oh, thanks for having me here. I'm excited to so, do it. So this is magic day. It's the day that... Uh, all of our, our wonderful little cute packages from Amazon show up on our doorstep uh, and we get little deals and get to sign up for, for all the cute little stuff as well. Yeah, if you live in Manhattan, you know, you, you enter your building and you get boxes just piled up everywhere. I mean, you know, last year during COVID, it was it was pretty extreme. But even now, just boxes piled up. You don't know what's yours. Uh, not that it's mine, but people just buying junk because they got it for 6% off. You know, you got you to gotta jump on that deal. You got to jump on that deal. And for me, you know, you know, this last year, we've been talking a lot about what's going on at Amazon. I think uh, the the organizing campaign in Bessemer highlighted and in a very positive way, I think. Uh, Personally, I I thought it was a a defeat from the start. But I, you know, you got to fight those fights, uh, even though you take your lumps. And, And to be honest, I think more positive messaging came out of that than I could have ever imagined. Oh, I mean, absolutely. I think that, you know, the, the amount of coverage it got, you know, people at uh, More Perfect Union were there, but Vice and so many different organizations, mainstream mainstream media, if we want to call it that, you know, just the politicians were there and, you know, really highlighted just how bad things are. You know, I think a lot of times Amazon can say, look, we create jobs. We have a $15 minimum wage and, you know, everything's hunky-dory. But, you know, they create a lot of jobs, but it also they also crush a lot of workers. And I think that the campaign in Bessemer really highlighted that and made people hopefully – think twice before they go buy, uh, they put something on auto delivery or auto repeat every, every month when they subscribe to something. So yeah, I, you know, it was not going to be an easy win, right? It's it's the biggest uh, e-retailer in the world. It's in Alabama, which is not super conducive to unionizing. But, you know, if you listen to the NLRB stuff or watch the coverage and, you know, watch the videos, I think that it made a big difference. And I, you know, next time around, we'll, we'll see, you know, the Teamsters are going to go try and unionize there now. Yeah, in fact, you know, I was just going to go that to where I was going. You know, today began the 30th uh, convention of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters where they've come out and said, look, they're they're going to pursue a national strategy to organize Amazon workers because, to be honest, uh, the future of work in this country will be irreparably harmed by Amazon's continued grow- massive growth. Oh, yeah, no question about it. And, you know, they what they hired 500,000 people last year, made a big deal out of it, another 75,000 uh, this past month they said they were going to try and hire. But turnover there's 150%. You know, Jeff Bezos, I think, in, in the past was quoted as saying he didn't want long-term employees at you know, the mid to lower range. He just called it like a march to mediocrity. He was not, he would, he would automate everything if he could, uh, and he's working on it. And so this is, you know, the line has to be drawn now. I think that people are becoming more aware, you know, despite the fact that our politics are in a, you know, a strange place because people prefer progressive policies, but we're not getting them out of the politicians. I think that people are waking up, and I think a movement as big as the Teamsters, especially, you know, they control the, you know, they're going to be doing delivery drivers. They control how these things get delivered. They can slow down the, the march of deliveries, and people will really feel that the way they wouldn't necessarily feel it if it was happening in Bessemer in a warehouse. Now, the thing that's interesting to me is I, I talk to a lot of workers every day, and a lot of people, as you pointed out, 150% turnover rate. That means they're they're churning through people at an alarming rate. And to be honest, you can't trip over a working person these days who hasn't done a little time, uh, you know, just like prison, done a little time in the Amazon, uh, the a- Amazon clink. And the horror stories that they tell, uh, they couldn't wait to get away. And I'm like, you know, there's there's this part of me that goes, you know, we shouldn't be running from this. We should be running to it to make it better and to, to demand things get better. But most people are like, screw it, I'm out of here. This is crazy. And it's it's allowed to continue. 
Yeah, you know, I guess what happens when you're a monopoly and you have no competition and no regulation, you know, it's just going to keep continuing and you'll turn to people when, you know, jobs are low, when service industry is not paying anything. You know, we're finally seeing some wages go up, thankfully, in, in the retail and service industry. But for a very long time, that wasn't the case. And if you look at Bessemer, they were paying $15 an hour, which was a pretty good wage there. I mean, they worked people to the bone and uh, they weren't able to use their health care because they either just quit or, you know, be, be fired after they, you know, took a breath, took a rest for five minutes. But until there's a force from the government, until the government is putting pressure on Amazon, uh, you know, and allowing competition and really reining them in through the NLRB and other other means, people are not going to be able to organize. They're not going to be able to stand up as an individual. I mean, you know, if you hire a million people, what are what is 10 to even 10,000 people going to do? Yeah. Um, and so yeah, it's got to come from the outside. And it, you go back to this at will employment situation where people are are terrified. Uh, to begin to organize because they can be fired for any reason whatsoever. Uh, not not for organizing. That's against the law, and, and <laughs> companies know this. But they follow and fire them for any other reason. You know, you got a red shirt on. Don't like red. That's not the company color today. You're fired, and that's perfectly legal. And what, what's happened is I think working people in this country have got some form of Stockholm syndrome where they've been abused for so long that it's now almost normal to be in that kind of a situation perpetually. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the numbers of unionization throughout the country over the last you know, generation, it's gone so down so precipitously. This, and the idea that, you know, Americans have to just uh, go it alone and be independent. I think that that really infects, I think, people's minds. And you know, I think whether you're working for Amazon or working for anyone else, I think most people are just grateful to have a job at this point. And that really leads to you wanting to stay, you know, stay quiet. You don't want to create a scene. You want to just do your job and get out of there and, you know, just be grateful that you have it. And, you know, workers should not be grateful that they are being put through the ringer to get paid minimum wage. You know, unfortunately, that's the system we've set up. Yeah. And, you know, hopefully that we need to make that sure that changes. No, I, you know, I go back to it. And I, in fact, I just had this conversation. You know, the, the, the person I was talking to said, you know, they pay 15 bucks an hour to do this warehouse work. And I said, you know, to be honest, when I started in warehouse work, you know, over 30 years ago, uh, the wage was 10 bucks an hour 30, 33 years ago, uh, which in today's dollars is, you know, more, almost double uh, what you're getting paid. Uh, so it's not that great of a job. Uh, what's happened is, is all the other jobs have gotten so bad that this seems like, oh, this is OK, when the reality is you're being worked to the bone and you're being exploited and don't really have a choice. Yeah, I mean, look, they, they do. I always say for them, they do give out coupons when they're trying to crush a union campaign for 15 minute break. So that, that's a that's a big deal, I think, a, a big perk for Amazon workers. But uh, you know, that's the problem when, you know, when inflation, uh, you know, minimum wage is not indexed to inflation and wages at the top keep rising and there's no raise, no rising wages at the lower level, then $15 an hour seems like a big deal. I mean, we're trying to get a $15 minimum wage right now nationally. That was a campaign started in 2013. You know, if they were to do it now, it would be, should it be like $20 an hour. But we continuously, you know, because it's such an uphill battle, even that buying power of the aspirational minimum wage is so low. And, you know, until we get to the point where there is a higher minimum wage and there is more competition for workers, then $15 an hour, unfortunately, is going to look really good, uh, you know, until you get to the point where you're working 12 hour shifts, four days a week, and you don't get a three day weekend because they give you Monday, Tuesday at work, Wednesday, you get to, you know, you get to take a break, Thursday and Friday, you're back to it. So uh, it's the Amazon's taking advantage of a situation of a culture of an economy, exploiting it and making it worse. And making it worse. That's the key to it. And, and I go back to, you know, behind every great billionaire, uh, the quote that I love behind every great billionaire, there's a great crime. And the great crime of Amazon was from the start uh, cheating states out of tax revenue and now cheating workers out of a living wage. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you talk about states out of tax revenue. Look, if there's there's some online sales tax in some places now. But, you know, a few years ago, I mean, I'm in here in New York, the, the road show that the try and tax breaks they tried to get to build a headquarters in Queens warehouse there. It, it was absurd. And, you know, people rose up and said, oh, we don't want this. And too many states and too many places are still giving that away, you know, and Democrats as well. You know, we had a, a mayor here, the governor here tried to bring that in and I uh, thought there'd be a feather in their cap. And until we have a political party that says, no, we're not going to give tax breaks to these terrible jobs, to these terrible corporations. They are going to have no reason to a uh, not just go to the highest bidder and b pay the lowest common denominator in wages. You know, we're seeing that even, you know, I'm working with some people in Wisconsin. There's now a paper, a uh, new factory for cars. Got a big tax break in Wisconsin. 
they're going down to South Carolina to build them because it's cheaper there. And so until every single state stops bidding against one another, uh, then this will continue. Yeah, the Osh, Oshkosh Bigosh people. Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah, they, they uh, announced the big, great new cars. The you know, was I think it was mail trucks. So they're going to be you know, environmentally friendly, but they're going to pay less money than non-union workers. Yeah, that, that seems to have what's become the American way because what's been allowed to happen, and this is where uh, I think what we're coming around to, and I think the younger generations coming around to this, and I, I know you guys have been doing a fantastic job over at uh, More Perfect Union um, of educating younger people about what unions are about and, and why they're so important. What's been allowed to happen in this country is we've been ripped apart by Taft Hartley and the no rights at work agenda that has created, you know, you know, dual countries, uh, countries where workers have a right to collectively bargain. They have the right to, to due process and just cause, and then a right to where the employer uh, has all the control and all the, all the say, uh, in these right to work states like South Carolina, which is where the investment is going, and it's our tax dollars that's that's funneling this this massive this massive shift from states like Wisconsin, Wisconsin and Washington State, where we're seeing massive job loss in the union sector. You know, a lot of those states you know, in the South, especially, I was we were doing a report on Dollar General and that whole the dollar stores there, and it's little, it's, it's not exactly Amazon, but the sheer number of people who are on public benefits while still working for Dollar Tree, for Dollar General. So they're not only getting the tax breaks, you know, these places are getting tax incentives. They're also, you know, having the state pay for their workers benefits. That's one of the things they sh supposedly should be doing. You know, I believe in Medicare for all, but uh, not in the, you know, the situation should be that if you get money from the state, you should be paying for workers. Um, I, I think that when you mentioned more per union, the work we're, and the work we've been doing, you know, I graduated college in 2008 and right into the great recession. And, you know, I think there's been studies that said people my age and people who graduated around the same time as me just permanently at a disadvantage in terms of pay, in terms of opportunities. You know, I've been lucky to, you know, work in journalism for a long time, but just bouncing from place to place, getting, uh, you know, every company bought off by another big company, whether it's uh, AOL or Verizon or, you know, every single monopoly you can think of. And I think that we're getting to the point where there's such a big divide between people at the very top and everyone else, especially, in, you know, or, uh, places like media. There is a solidarity that's created, created, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, journalists would have said, oh, I'm in the upper crust. I'm in the one percent. Uh, I got to get a nice pension. But I think that when it gets to the point where there's every, people at the very, very top, the Jeff Bezos is literally going to space instead of paying workers. You know, Elon Musk going to space uh, instead of paying people more than twenty five dollars an hour. And his factory that should be that was thirty five dollars an hour 30 years ago. I think that people are starting to realize, you know, it's it becomes a strange solidarity when it becomes like the 1% literally, and then 99% everyone else is really, you know, not just middle class, but struggling. No, and this is where, you know, I keep coming back to this idea that uh, we're going to have to fight the same battles that my great grandparents had to fight. Uh, you know, the, you know the, the things that, and, and, and the problem is, is we don't know our labor history. Uh, we don't know what it took to fight for the eight hour day. We don't know what it took to fight for the weekends. Uh, we don't know what it took to fight for all of the regulations and the, and the laws that we take for granted. Uh, and that are being stripped from us. And we're going to have to refight these fights again. And the young people that I talk to and, and say, look, this is our history. Uh, they're like, well, how did we lose this stuff? I'm going, well, um, you know, my, my generation and uh, the, the generation before me gave it away because they thought they were all going to be millionaires. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a great myth, right? That if, if you just stay focused and you do you uh, fight for yourself, then you're going to end up OK. I mean, I also am heartened by just the amount of number. I look at the media a lot, the number of people in the media who are now unionizing because they realize that they've just been, you know, exploited. And they've had so many, uh, you know, there's one star reporter getting paid all the money and then or one star columnist and no one else is doing well. I worry that, you know, the amount of remote work that is starting up, people are no longer those ties that bind are sort of disappearing. But uh, I think that there's, you know, right now, Biden has introduced you know, two new people to NLRB who are, you know, union lawyers. It's a really good thing. And I think that so long as the playing field is evened, it doesn't even have to be shifted towards workers. You know, it just needs to be evened. I watched all the Amazon NLRB hearings. The, their appeal of, of the, uh, what you call it, RDWSU was appealing the, the loss. And Amazon just had no problem with just intimidating people, having people wander around the floor saying, hey, did you get your ballot? You need help filling it out? Wink, wink. Uh, you know, telling people that, you know, the union's going to take your money. They're going to go on vacations and you're not going to get anything out of it. You know, they, they put flyers all over the bathroom everywhere. And I think that at some point, 
I don't know. I think people are going to say, well, uh, can't get worse than it is now. And we're, maybe we're reaching that point. But here's the thing. And this is where, you know, this is where I'm, I struggle because if I'm, if I'm seeing this in front of me, and I guess, you know, I go back to something my grandfather always said. He said, if a rich guy is going to take a buck out of his pocket to tell you you don't need something, you better spend two to get it because uh, he understands return on investment. So I see all of this money that Amazon spent $200 million to convince that workforce that, no, they didn't need this little union. No, they've got an open door policy. And no, we're going to treat you well, well, oh, we're going to treat you well, less bad, uh, however you're going to put that. And and people voted against it. it. was insane to me. For me, I would have said they're going through all this, all of this, uh, you know, having the police harass the organizers, you know, having constant surveillance of the, the mailbox that they had the postal service drop into, into the, into the place. All of the things that they did, hiring convicts to walk around with sandwich boards, you know, bad mouthing the unions, you know, being spl ba just spl plastering the bathrooms with stuff. I'd be going, uh, if they're going through this to convince me, no, I gotta have this. What yeah. happened to us as a society that looks at this and goes, oh, yeah, they're spending all this money because they care about me. When did that happen? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. It's not funny, but I don't think a lot of people know, and I'm still learning them, the, the rights that workers have in terms of turnings of, uh, you know, unionizing. You know, we're so used to a, a culture where just the boss is the absolute boss, and that's that, what they say goes. You know, you're not allowed to have even just a suggestion. You're not supposed to make things better while people are trying to unionize. That is a, a law within labor law. That's ignored right they'll get people away look at away swag they have away shirts they say oh yeah things are getting a little bit better here maybe they're they're trying to make things better for us if people realize that that stuff was illegal and it goes against labor law you know they might realize hey i don't need to take this and i think so maybe the first step is you know a big education campaign uh because so many of us you know are you know didn't get to work in you know they didn't have that union background you know, that's this, an excellent we're almost point. starting from scratch yeah no, that's an excellent point uh and, and to your point you know pennsylvania's labor uh, pennsylvania's workers compensation law to this day written back in 1915 still refers to the employer employee relationship as as master and servant wow. uh, our law still says that uh, even though hopefully we've well never mind um <laughs> <laughs> legislature that's pretty rough uh, but I think it's a, it's the proper descriptive the term there because I think a lot of us, a lot of people think that way. You know, the, the, they're the king. You know, when I come in here, I'm their servant. And I've never, I guess probably because I've always had a union job, I've never thought of it that way. I've thought of it as, you know, I come here to work. You use my labor how you can to make the most out of it you can. And I want some of it back. It's a partnership, not a master-servant relationship. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's it's partly that, you know, until the government starts enforcing that, and so until the government starts, you know, forcing a rise of wage, you know, they're giving people opportunities and saying, hey, uh, you're not indebted because you don't have student debt. I mean, it, it all comes together, right? You know, yeah. people are just credit card student debt. They, they can't get better jobs because of retail and uh, all those things are just the, in the toilet in terms of wages. Like you said, $15 an hour shouldn't be great, but it is, uh, you know, until, you know, again, Amazon takes advantage, but the circumstances that lead people to Amazon. I don't, I don't think it's because they're like excited to be at Amazon and just want to pitch in. I think it's because that's where they end up having to be. It's desperation. And, no, you're absolutely, yeah. it's, it's desperation. You're absolutely right. Uh, but here's the thing. And we're in this weird minute. I got another minute left. Um, yeah. We're in this weird moment because we can't seem to get anything passed. Uh, we've got the, the horrors of Taft Hartley and all of the attacks of the NLRA, which has basically just made the law almost worthless and toothless because if you look at all of the abuses that amazon got away with and they've been getting and companies have been getting away with that for you know for decades um you know the employees got very little hope in this sure. um i say we got to pass some major comprehensive reform you know i grew up during the carter years where there was hope of repealing taft hartley i voted for bill clinton with the hope of a strike replacement bill bill i voted for uh, barack obama because he told me twice we're getting something better than the employee free choice act uh, and now here we've got this pro act that it's right there it's right there but n never going to happen because uh, we've got joe manchin and kelly simina you know, it, it's, I mean, the two of them are, you know, just sort of just drive me, drive me crazy. I think like everyone else, you know, I think it's also, you know, it's not just them, it's others. There's a lot of vested interests that are, you know, pushed even in New York, there's a lot of corporate Democrats that are being pushed by real estate that have no interest in, you know, really helping out workers. I think that, I think it's about rooting out that corruption throughout the entire party. Yeah. And I'm hoping that, you know, filibuster goes and we are able to get more free elections, more free and fair elections. 
you know, we're seeing in New York, we've seen a lot of, you know, primary candidates beat out the more established Democrats. And as we have these districts that are more fair, I'm hoping that becomes more of a competitive game in terms of primaries. And perhaps that'll scare Democrats into either, uh, you know, getting their stuff together and, you know, working for a union endorsement uh, and union hopefully to stop just endorsing the guy with power. You know, <laughs> I've seen that happen with Cuomo too many times here in New York. And, uh, you know, so it's all, it's all connected. And I think that being able to get hopefully the uh, some version of the For the People Act will create accountability and politicians will stop making these promises, whether it's $15 minimum wage, the PRO Act, uh, all those things, and then not come through with them and then say, well, I'm better than a Republican. Yeah, well, we'll see where this takes us. Uh, but Sekar, I appreciate you taking time for us. Uh, as always, good stuff. Uh, I hope you'll come back and talk with us again real soon. Yeah, thanks for having us. This is great. Uh, good stuff, Jordan Sekarin, uh, media producer there at More Perfect Union. Make sure you check out the work they do over at perfectunion.us. Uh, we'll get links out on how you can take a look at that. Quick break, right back after this. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. Saving work in America, one show at a time. The Rick Smith Show.